Dr. Yedikola. So, um, thank you. So we're switching now to complex diseases. Uh, so, uh, oh, pardon. So um, complex diseases are due to multiple uh, genetic and environmental risk factors that each have small effects individually, uh, but uh, that uh, combined uh, lead to the occurrence of the disease, and they may also interact with each other. So um, as we have seen yesterday, genome-wide association studies have been the major breakthrough in the identification of genetic risk factors of complex diseases. In fact, they have led to the identification of over 2,000 robust uh, genetic associations with over 300 diseases or traits. Uh, and in fact, the pace of discoveries continues to increase quite steadily. So some uh, diseases have had a uh, quite a rich harvest with uh, over 95 genes d discovered for lipid traits, for instance, between 45 and 70 genes for Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, or coronary heart disease. So for other diseases such as stroke, for instance, the number of genes discovered is less, and this is in great part probably due to the heterogeneity of the disease, and it seems that um, actually most of the genetic risk variants for stroke lie at the level of the subtypes, as has been shown by the Metastroke uh, study, and also by, uh, uh, re more recently by the uh, dissection at GWAS, which is dissection, cervical artery dissection being one of the major causes of ischemic stroke in, in young adults. So one interesting observation uh, that uh, came out of genome-wide association studies is the amount of pleiotropy um, um, across uh, complex diseases. So pleiotropy corresponds to shared genetic variation across traits or diseases. And it turns out that 16% uh, of the genes that were identified through GWAS are shared across at least two different uh, traits or diseases, and about 4% of the SNPs are shared. So the, this pleiotropy uh, depends a little bit on the, I mean, uh, it differs according to the location of the gene and to the potential transcriptional uh, consequences. And they're also stronger for some diseases, especially immune-related diseases or uh, cancer. And here's an example of the major pleiotropy of uh, genes identified as risk factors for Crohn's disease, for instance. And this is actually teaching us also a lot about the underlying pathophysiology of diseases, to see these links at the genetic level between uh, between different diseases. So despite these major advances, uh, GWAS have a number of limitations. First of all, as we uh, mentioned briefly yesterday, with a few exceptions, they have identified only genetic markers, and the causal variants and causal genes are, are so far uh, largely unknown. The second important limitation is that until now, even in cases where a very large number of genes have been identified, these genes uh, actually explain only a very small proportion of the heritability of the disease as uh, has been estimated by family studies, typically about 10% or less. And finally, a very strong criticism has been that to date there have been very little clinical applications of these findings. So I will just uh, discuss briefly each of these limitations. So first of all, about the um, uh, significance of these variants that are identified. In fact, it turns out that the vast majority, 93% of the SNPs identified through GWAS are located in non-coding regions. Um, so these may be involved in transcriptional regulation, and we have uh, now a much better understanding of what they may mean through the uh, recent ENCODE project that was um, published by, uh, I think, uh, eight uh, simultaneous paper in Nature and, and in Science and 20 companion papers at, at the end of last year, and that gives a very comprehensive description of functional element within the genome. So this may, helpful, uh, may be very helpful in annotating the, uh, the, the GWAS findings. And they have shown, for instance, that actually the um, SNPs identified through GWAS more, more often and significantly more often map to DNA's hypersensitive sites or to transcri transcription factor binding sites than would be predicted by chance. So um, that is quite interesting. So the second criticism is that these um, findings explain only a small proportion of the heritability. And so where could be the missing heritability? So one first explanation is that the tagging is imperfect. What we're looking at is just markers. So if we could look at the actual causal variants, maybe the effect size could be larger and the um, heritability explained could be larger as well. So that's the first potential explanation. Then the second one is that um, uh, GWAS have been looking mostly at common variants, and um, it will be important now to explore also low frequency and rare variants that probably also have an important role in complex diseases. Uh, in addition, GWAS uh, are not very good for um, uh, capturing structural variants, such as copy number variants, for instance, which uh, have been shown to be important in uh, many, uh, several complex diseases, especially psychiatric disorders such as autism, for instance. 
then um, the polygenic component has been quite popular the, lately as well, uh, meaning that um, variants with small effects uh, may not be detected individually, but when combining them in a polygenic score, this may also contribute to the heritability of diseases. Um, then gene environment, gene gene interactions haven't been accounted for sufficiently yet. And finally, um, not all genetic variation lies at the level of nucleotides, and there are also epigenetic modifications such as um, uh, changes that modulate the packaging of DNA and uh, can um, um, influence the expression of genes. So I would just like to um, spend a little more time on the low frequency and rare variants, and I, I can skip actually this slide which was explained very much in detail by uh, Professor Tony Lasserre. I just want to point out that um, next generation sequencing has also been, the, uh, has been probably the, the, the second major breakthrough for genetics of complex diseases after GWAS, uh, because it enables much cheaper sequencing of larger samples. Uh, so one specificity compared to analyses that had been performed on common variants is that for the analysis of rare variants, uh, um, more elaborate statistical techniques need to be used uh, because of the lower power due to the low frequency of the uh, uh, variant studies. So um, the, the, the rare variants tend to be combined within a gene to obtain sufficient power, and it is also possible through um, uh, certain methods to include functional information and give more weight, for instance, to variants that have uh, more functional importance. There have been some results uh, that came out already from uh, this type of study. So, uh, for instance, uh, mutation in the APP gene was shown to protect against Alzheimer's disease in an Icelandic study. So it should be noted that, in fact, population isolates are, are very appropriate for studying rare variants because uh, you have uh, an increased genetic homogeneity and then the rare variants tend to, to drift up in frequency, so it is a little bit easier to study rare variants in population isolates. However, there have been some successes as well in uh, studies that have not used population isolates, um, such as this one that identified an association with TREMP2 variants with Alzheimer's disease as well. So I had another example, but I don't have enough time. And finally, the foremost criticism, I think, has been the seemingly slow pace of converting GWAS findings and, uh, well, findings from complex disease genetics in general to clinical applications. But uh, it should be, uh, people should remember that, in fact, most uh, GWAS findings uh, are just two or three years old. So this is very little time. And in fact, in the past, the conversion from uh, scientific discoveries to clinical applications has been much, much longer than that. So um, there are some uh, you know, promising elements suggesting that eventually we may, uh, this may lead to some clinical applications. What is expected from these findings well, the, the common point is that it will hopefully improve our understanding of the underlying biology, and this has been shown, I, know, I think, now for several examples. And this improved understanding could lead to novel therapeutic target and strategies. Probably this will probably be the, the, the biggest application, perhaps in some instances to better risk prediction, and uh, also in some more limited situation to um, you know, personalize, so-called personalized medicine, personalized medicine taking into account genetic uh, um, variation uh, for drug response and toxicity. So just a few very quick examples uh, for each of these aspects for drug development. So uh, genetics of Crohn's disease have highlighted the, the, the big importance of autophagy in this disorder, and, and this opens avenues for new uh, therapeutic strategies. Um, so uh, more concretely, rare variants in the PCSK9 gene were shown to modulate lipid levels, but also to be associated with coronary artery disease, and this has led to the development of novel lipid-lowering agents. Um, how about risk prediction? So this is, has been probably the most disappointing application so far because the identified genetic variants are associated with a very modest increase in risk, odds ratios less than 1.5 most of the time, and so there's a very marginal gain in risk prediction compared to non-genetic risk factors. However, there may be some uh, restricted applications, uh, especially in terms of improving risk stratification. So this has been shown, for instance, for uh, coronary heart disease, where um, adding the genetic risk information to the uh, standard risk factors enables to reclassify individuals from a certain disease category to another, and this is particularly interesting for individuals who are initially in the intermediate risk group and can be reclassified into the high risk group. So this is particularly important for diseases where risk stratification is important in uh, prevention, preventive strategies. And finally, just a last slide on you know, the, the potential applications of uh, response to, to uh, toxicity, uh, um, uh, drug or response to toxicity. So these are two examples of pharmacogenomic studies that have shown uh, in, uh, gene, and, gene uh, and uh, drug interaction with um, uh, respect to risk of myopathy 
uh, in people taking statins on the left-hand side, and with respect to risk of uh, recurrent vascular events after coronary angioplasty and stenting uh, in people taking clopidogrel, and there are currently uh, efforts and even randomized trial ongoing to, to uh, test whether these uh, uh, findings can be implemented in clinical practice. So I uh, would like to end by thanking the, all the consortia that have uh, taught me so much about genetic epidemiology and um, the wonderful people I'm working with. And last, uh, especially special thanks to the Leduc Foundation again for their wonderful support. Thank you. Thank you.